Next up, we have one of our female heroes on stage. Her name is Eda Ertrul. I hope I pronounced it correctly now. I practiced in the coffee break. Um, she is account manager of one of our main sponsors, OneTrust. They also have a stand outside. And um, she's an expert in the field of data protection, IT, security, and preference management. And she supports companies in introducing effective software solutions and implementing automations in order to collect the user data. Um, what she will be talking about now is content-based marketing and how data protection and marketing can actually work together successfully. So how can you use and leverage data, but still do it data compliant? Because in marketing, GDPR developed from a framework and a regulation that we ha all have to be compliant with to actually a strategic development. And taking a closer look at customer-centric approaches in marketing is definitely um, worth your time. And this is what Eda will be doing now. She will tell us how it can be implemented in practice and what you need to consider to do it right in your businesses. And with that, I want to welcome Eda on stage. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see you, or not see you all. I'm Eda. Um, thanks, Nina, for the introduction. I am working since one and a half years at OneTrust um, for the DAC region, everything related consent management, how do you manage consent, how you capture consent, how you maximize the consent that you eventually captured for your marketing strategies and for anything else that you really want to do. Um, I'm here today with two of my colleagues. Um, and lucky enough, I was the speaker today. Um, for anything that you want to know or we want to find out later, we're also outside and we're also today at the dinner. So with those I haven't spoken yet, I'm looking forward to speak to you and let me get started. So I have a few things on the agenda today. One is of course, um, what is the current, land current landscape when it comes to consent management um, and capturing consent? Um, what have these developments looked like? Um, we've seen now third-party data is going away, cookies will be going away, everyone is focusing now on zero-party data, first-party data. What is it exactly? How can you maximize the management and the content that you've gathered from those? At the end, we are aiming to have a little Q&A, ideally also with my colleague outside, so if anything is open or you want to find out more, we're all right outside where you can see us. So let's get started with data privacy and marketing and the current landscape. What does the current landscape currently look like? First of all, a little historic back. When you, when you have looked at a product or when you have talked to a customer, um, you didn't have any internet, you didn't have a phone, you didn't have any advertisement really on your phone that is aimed to, you know, um, show you the content of a certain product. You didn't have any cookies. There was nothing, there was maybe word of mouth. So what really mattered back in the time was, okay, what is this company or this product all about? What is the price of this and what is the quality? These were the two very simple factors that you used to look at, or I used to look at back in the day. Moving forward, other factors became important, such as, okay, what is, um, what is this company's experience. How long has this company been on the market? Do they actually know what they're talking about? What is the engagement in the other fields that they do? And now, when we look at here and now, we have seen with emerging laws, customers, me and you, have given or gained a certain sensibility of, of my data. So we've seen it now everywhere, not just five years ago, that you're currently being asked daily on if you want to consent on how your data is being used or is being processed. And sometimes you don't even know what that means. We have seen in many, many studies and also in the study that I'm showing you right now that trust and transparency, and if a company can provide those, they are more trusted and they gain their customers quicker, but also they can keep them longer. So this, uh, the study that I'm currently showing you is saying 70% of the customers say a trust is brand more important than ever. And this is eventually where we come in as one trust. So with everything that is being changing, I want to summarize the three challenges that organizations 
currently have when it comes to um, data management. First of all is the increasing regulatory landscape. It is not just the GDPR. Globally, we have seen dozens of um, data laws emerging, dozens of regulations that tell you how to manage data, how to capture data, when is, when is something legally processed correctly, when, did, when is something captured in a compliant way, is it, kept, is it kept long enough, what is the data retention to keep sensitive personal data, what is the data retention to keep other sorts of data, and did I actually, are you actually keeping the data that you've consented to keep? I may have given my consent that you know I like female sunglasses, but not maybe in what kind of healthcare products I'm interested in. So you really have to stay on top of your privacy management program. Um, the impact that this has on organizations is also, yes, we all know what the GDPR says, but what does that look like in practice? What does it look like on my everyday daily marketing schemes? That's one aspect of it. The other thing is, with those regulatory landscapes, everything around has begun um, to adapt to these landscapes. So we now have Facebook, Twitter, Google, all these technologies have emerged that you know also want your data. So what is now happening is if you want to personalize or if you want to capture certain data, you want to have a look and, and how this is being done. And ideally, also as a growing business, you want to look at it from a perspective of, okay, from a proactive perspective. So you don't want to chase the regulations, you actually want to keep on top of them. And the third one is awareness. Something I just mentioned recently, now suddenly your stakeholders are in, interested in that you th do things in a compliant way. You are, as a customer, interested in into knowing how that looks like. So, in a summary, there are a lot of things actually changing on your day-to-day -day business that you want to consider. So, privacy and customer experiences try to go to a different route. You have, you have here your privacy regulations telling you what you need to comply with, what you need to be looking out for. And at the same time, you want to ensure the best possible customer experience. So how will that work if you have all these things in a way holding you back or wanting the attention to you know, develop your privacy program? So what is becoming more and more important and more and more is first party and zero party data data that me and you need to actually consent on. You need, you need that click, you need that very firm act of um, consent that you want to keep and that, that you want to use. In order to do so, and to, in order to really get that consent, you have to be a trusted brand. There's no way around it anymore, and that's not just with the study that I've just shown, dozens of studies show it. So, and on the other hand, from a marketing perspective, because now you have the privacy team that you want to be compliant with, but also from a marketing perspective, you want to target the right audience, the right customers. It, there's, no, there's no way, you don't want to waste your time targeting someone who is absolutely not showing any interest of buying. So, oh, one too much. But also from a revenue of, in, in, uh, revenue of income perspective, of course, um, We've all believed that, with the 50%, especially believe that um, by the end, the third-party cookies will be going away and you will have to focus on zero and first-party data. Um, and what's more scaring is we all see this coming, but only a third of it is really fully prepared with a product and ideally with a software that can manage it those. There's always the try to manage it by yourself, but you end up running after things that have been missing later. So. What can this look like in practice? There are a few things that your privacy teams or your marketing teams will want to consider. One of them is, of course, what is the structure of your database? You want to uh, target the right people, you want to generate those leads, you want to use them, you want to keep them. How do you do that? How do you reach the customer from a marketing perspective? As a brand perspective, the brand reputation, the trust in the brand is equally important. You want to control how you communicate to your customer. You want to be able that the customer also ideally communicates back to you so you can use what they're saying in order to target them better. Um, from a marketing perspective, you want to try out things. Targeting customers in healthcare is very, very different than targeting customers for sunglasses or fashion or anything other. So it's, there's, no, there's no one single playbook in how to target certain, certain kinds of people or certain kinds of 
um, branches. At OneTrust, we thought about, okay, how can we see these challenges that are for your privacy team, for your marketing team, and really fill the gap that is currently existing. So one of them is, as a privacy team, you look, look, you look at the legal aspects. You want to make sure you can lean back and say, okay, I'm compliant with those dozens of um, regulations, some of them in the US, some of them in Germany, or with the GDPR or the whatnot. So you want to look at this. And ideally, you don't want to put yourself into a position where you then can get a fine or, you know, uh, risk a fine or lose customers because they just, you know, lose their trust in you. The other one is, of course, with the data that you've now collected in a compliant way, you want to use it, you want to activate the data. What does that data actually mean? You want to do maybe certain A-B testings to find out what works and what doesn't work. So with what we thought and what we have built at OneTrust is kind of a tool where both players come together, both teams and both um, structures working together. So it doesn't matter then in which team you are today, if it's to the privacy or the IT risk or the security, whatnot, you want to be able to have a sustainable chain, um, chain, chain of thought, but also sustainable direction that will keep those customers with you. So I've mentioned it before, I'm looking now at the earned data that is ultimately what will be relevant or is already very relevant now. Um, the data that you can collect can be zero-party data, ideal. I tell you what I want. I tell you what, I, what I'm interested in. I'm interested in sunglasses. And the first-party data that you capture can be browsing history, can be locational data, social media interactions, but ideally the communication preferences, what I tell you what I like in a newsletter or in a preference center is what you will want to look at now and what you will look at in the next five years. So, consent can mean not just yes and no, it can also mean I'm interested in one thing or in the other. So, we have looked at different consent and preferences types that you not only collect consent, but you that maybe enable me or your customer to communicate with you, with you what I'm really interested in. This can be, of course, via SMS, it can be I sign up for an email newsletter, it can be I'm sharing my location with you, or ideally also I can tell you um, in what frequency I want to hear from you. Um, we don't wanna, maybe I don't wanna hear monthly from you, maybe I wanna hear every two months, maybe I wanna hear weekly, depending on what it is that I need or what it is that I'm interested in. If you enable your customers to really give you um, that information, not just only have you have a more real information that you can use, but also I know what kind of information now you have on me. I have provided this company with information that I want, that I'm interested in your healthcare products and that I want to hear from you on a monthly basis. So it's a two-way street. One of them is, is for me as a customer, the trust that I have to see what kind of data do you have on me, because I pretty much doubt that you all know what kind of data company XYZ currently has on you. I don't even know. So seeing really what kind of data you have on me and how I can by myself manage that data and not write the DPO on the homepage I've, uh, I've, I've just seen um, what I want and not want, can be a good interaction with your customers, but also ensure that you are compliant. And this is exactly where those two teams then come in. So what can this look like in real? So we have five steps, very quickly summarized, what I am actually trying to say to you today. One of them is you want to increase opt-in rates. Yes, there are certain ways to do it. How does it look graphically? I'll show you in a second. You want to reduce unsubscribes. Maybe if you are offering five, six, seven products, maybe I'm interested in three of them. Good, but I don't want to hear about all the four of them. So is the only option that I really have to unsubscribe to all of them? Or will you give me the opportunity to actually communicate to you, hey, I'm only interested in three of them, come target me. So you, know, so you see there will be a little bit of a difference. The other thing is, of course, um, with that, marketing knows way better what to do, knows way better how to target, knows way better how to communicate to the customer, and then, um, you know, develop their marketing strategies also in all the fields. And the, the, the last four steps is then really 
you know, for the legal team or for the compliance team to ensure that they've done everything right and then ideally for the customer perspective that they have in the trust. So this is, those four steps are actually an ongoing journey. So as an example on what this can look like, we've all seen it before, but what does it actually look when I talk about consent? The first is, okay, I come onto a web page, I see, do I consent to your cookies? Uh, yes, no, okay. But ideally, we call this at one trust collection points, data collection points, consent collection points. So what that consent is and for what it is used, you define it. You define it with your policies. Why do you want that? Why do you want exactly that kind of content and why, when you, why do you want to do use it for? We have, we have our regulations, we have in Europe, and especially what we are all here for today is also the GDPR. We know what the, what, uh, when we can process personal data and whatnot. And we, we know, is it on a legitimate basis? Is it the interest? Why do you need to process it? So ideally, first step is fine. With an anonymous cookie ID, you, manage, you agree to certain tracking technologies or not. But it's not only just that. If you, we all signed up for a newsletter before, I certainly have to get that 10% discount on my first purchase. But what happens is, two weeks later, I get emails. This is new, this is new, this is new. We have an offer here, we have an offer there. So this is, that's a different kind of marketing content now that has been implemented or um, done by that marketing company as a strategy that I keep that company in mind, that I exactly know what's going on and if I you know, want to buy more, ideally. So another consent, another purpose defined by you. The other one would then be what we call um, preference center, is that I can manage these preferences. The GDPR is very clear. The way you collect consent and the flexibility you give that customer, this is, should be exactly the way that the, that the customer manages this consent. If I can give consent easily, I should be also able to withdraw it easily. So what can this preference center look like? We have it, of course, first with a cookie, with the, with the cookie preference center where you see the, what kind of categories you have, you opt in, you opt out, but ideally you manage your consent. Moving forward, so this can look like in a web form, on a mobile app maybe, um, you name it, depending on what you use, but in most cases it's a website, it can then look like this. I'm volunteering maybe, uh, at an NGO to participate in an event, or I want to know more. This is exactly what we've all seen before. It's, it's nothing new, but only now that I can have options. And with the options that I give, and with the options that I agree to be targeted with, these are the options that will be shown in my preference center to manage later. So, another example, if you're interested in a certain product, you let us know in what product you're interested in. From a marketing perspective, it's definitely quality over quantity. And from a legal perspective, what are the things that you need to consider? So depending on the regulation that or in the country you're operating in, you want to and you need to tell your customer, okay, wait a second, Edda has consented three months ago to this kind of consent or to this kind of purpose that we've just defined. Okay, um, if I want to see now the data you have on me, you need to tell me and you, I need to know what have you communicated to me at that time. Maybe you change your policies, which I'm sure you do, but maybe three months ago you had a different policy than you had now. It doesn't matter. I need to know what I have consented to at that time. And if you change your policies later, that's a different story. But you need to be able to, and it will happen. Data subjects will want to know the data. data sub you will need to show your local authorities, in case of a check, what has been collected and for what, for what purpose. So how do you do it if you have thousands of data subjects? And if you have maybe dozens of changing policies? So it, will, it sounds like an easy job, but it is actually not that easy to manage all in one place. You might have, have tool A, you have tool B, you have tool C, and maybe I've... You know, I've done a click or I consented something that is relevant for tool A, but maybe also for tool C. So you go around looking, looking, looking on where is my data. But in one tool, you can manage it all together. And this is exactly what I would try to show you. That's another example on what it can look like. Of course, ideally what is happening now is personalization. You have all the information on, what, on that one person, the name, where is that person located, what is, the, what is this person interested in. But at the back, you have different things collected. 
different things collected in one platform with one trust, ideally. <laughs> and you see then that whatever you've collected now for the purpose that you've defined is now being automatically in a single, in a single second communicated then to your other tools. Also, if you want to gather this information back, you can also do it within seconds with us. So you look at it, okay, and you say, okay, and on those five different tools, this is all kind of data that I have. And you're staying on top of your data governance program, on, on top of your constant collection points and not behind if someone asks. So, um, what would happen if you suddenly can't use 80% of the data then that you have? So in, within one, tr one tool, you have kind of one, one truth, you go back to it and you show it with them. Within minutes, seconds, with nothing else that you would need, if you know, go and look at all these tools altogether. This is probably the most important slide because this one summarizes all I have, and I have a few minutes left, is the consonant management side where you then see the data collection points up there. These are the points where you collect data, and below, the preference center where your customer can interact with you, your marketing team, and also give that consent, withdraw that consent, adapt the consent, etc. Everything that comes in comes into the OneTrust platform where you then see, okay, exactly on a legal perspective what you need to show, but also for your marketing strategies, you can perform A-B testings with us. You can see, okay, what worked in which way, um, what did I show to my customer, what did the customer agree to. And this can then be furthermore communicated to all your marketing tools. It's pretty exciting. So um, I know I talk very fast and if there are any questions, as I said, my colleagues and I will be outside, but bear in mind um, that we, we, we'd love to show you more for sure. Um, and it is actually very exciting once you get a touch of it. So um, well, thank you for listening. Um, for any questions, please outside and thank you for yeah, thank you for listening. It was really fun. <laughs>